Well, I invite your attention this morning to Philippians chapter 1, the chapter we read together, and especially verses 12 uh, to verse 18. Verse 12 to verse 18 of one, uh, Philippians chapter 1. Just before I read the passage to you again, just to explain that Paul is in prison, that you can see that through what he says here, he's in prison, and it's his reaction. Uh, he's writing to the Philippians about his reaction to being in prison. And this is what he says, Philippians chapter 1 and verse 12. I would that you should understand, brethren, that the things which happened unto me have fallen out rather unto the furtherance of the gospel so that my bonds, or my chains, in Christ are manifest in all the palace and in all other places. And many of the brethren in the Lord, waxing confident by my bonds, gaining boldness, gaining confidence by his own sufferings, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Some indeed preach Christ even of envy and strife, and some also of goodwill. The one preached Christ of contention, not sincerely, supposing to add affliction to my bonds, but the other of love, knowing that I am set for the defense of the gospel. What then? Notwithstanding every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is preached. And I therein do rejoice, yea, and will rejoice. Philippians chapter 1, verses 12 to 18. Now I find this, uh, speaking for myself, I find this a remarkable uh, passage. It's something I can understand, but it's way beyond my experience. This man has an attitude, Paul here, that just leaves me dumbstruck. I, I find it an amazing attitude that he's got. I can explain the attitude. I can say he did this and that and the other. But the fact is, there's, this man is showing such a remarkable spirit here that it just, as I say, leaves me out of my depth completely. I'm preaching it really, not, be, I'm, not I'm, preaching, I'm certainly not preaching it because I've attained to it. Quite the opposite. Uh, but uh, I preach it because uh, I believe it's an important section. I think it says some things which are very important uh, for believers in their daily lives, but also in the gospel itself, uh, as I'll try to explain. Well, the background is this. Paul is in prison. Now, we don't know, apparently, according to the commentators, we don't know exactly which uh, prison this is. Uh, some people think it's in Jerusalem. Some people think it's in Rome. I happen to think it's in Rome. I think it's at that stage in his life. This is not important to understand this, to get this sorted out. I'm not dealing with the life of Paul this morning, but I think it is actually in the palace prison in Rome. And uh, I believe it's not his house arrest, which, according to the end of Acts, he was in house arrest for two years, I think. I think he's actually in a dungeon here. I think he's actually in chains. So I think he's in the lowest possible, worst possible condition. He talks in verse 13 about his bonds in Christ. What he means, what he's talking about is chains. As remember when he was before Agrippa, he held his hands up. I'm sure he held his hands up. And he says to Agrippa, I want everybody to be like me apart from these chains. 
And it's his attitude when he's in prison. I mean, let's be clear about prison. I've passed High Point this morning. Now, I've never been in High Point. Perhaps you have. I don't know what it's like in there. Uh, I, I have been in Warwick Castle. And I have been in the dungeons in Warwick Castle. Uh, and I have seen how appalling it must have been for people thrown into those dungeons. There's one little section there called the Oublier, which is French because it was Norman Castle. It's French for forgettery. They would put a man that they wanted to forget and stick him in this cage and stick him in a very nasty place within the prison. I can go as far as that, I think, and forget all about him. Others are hung up on the wall in cages and all sorts, you know. This is the kind of prison he's in. We got the record in uh, Act 16 about the time he was in the stocks, uh, shackled and manacled uh, in the darkness in the inner prison with his back bleeding. We, we know about that and so on. This is not colour television and all hot and cold in every room. This is the worst possible condition. But that's not the greatest suffering for Paul. This man we know is a preacher. We know he's been converted to Christ and we know from records in the Acts that Christ, when he converted him, said to him, your life's work from now on is to go around as far as you can and as many places as you can and preach the gospel to bring as many Gentiles, in your case, as possible to Christ. And the rest of his life was spent, consumed by this preaching of the gospel, traveling everywhere and taking every opportunity to preach. But now he is in prison. Not because of any offense, not because of any crime, but simply because, in the basic element of it, he has been preaching the gospel because he has been preaching Christ. Now, I've come over here today. I, I'm not expecting to be locked up because I'm preaching the gospel to you this morning. I might get other responses, but I won't get that one as far as I know. But this is what this man's got. He's silenced. And I believe that that would be the biggest burden to him to be cut off from his opportunity of preaching. His life was consumed by it. He, he says to the Corinthians, woe is me if I preach not the gospel. I am determined to preach the gospel, he said. I'm determined to preach nothing else but the gospel, to preach Christ and him crucified. As I say again, woe is me. I'm a miserable man. I'm a wretched man if I cannot preach the gospel. John Bunyan, when he was put in Bedford jail for 12 years, it wasn't quite so bad as that, actually, but he was in Bedford jail on and off for 12 years. He had a certain amount of liberty, I think, but nevertheless, he was in prison, and that was just simply because he would not use the prayer book. John Owen and other late Puritans, again with Bunyan at the same time, they were silenced because they were Puritans. They were stopped preaching. And Samuel Rutherford, another Puritan, a Scottish man, about the same time, he was silenced and put in prison. And he wrote about what he called, I wouldn't use his language, but he talked about his dumb Sabbath when he was not allowed to preach. These men felt the frustration of that. I, I could digress there, and if any young man ever said to me, do you think I ought to be a preacher, I would give him the same advice as Spurgeon gave men. If you can do anything else, do it. Anything but. The only reason a man should preach is because he feels bound to, because he feels an inward pressure that nothing uh, will help him unless he just preaches. He can't do anything else. I think it's Jeremiah said about the fire burning in him. 
We want some of that. No, we want a great deal of it. We want men who could do nothing else but preach. And their greatest problem and burden in trial and affliction is when they're not allowed to preach. These late Puritans who were denied preaching, people like John Owen and John Bunyan and others, what did they do? They turned to writing to try and to vent their feelings, to try and express what they wanted to preach, what they would like to preach, but were not allowed to preach. They just couldn't remain silent. God in his mercy overruled their silence, so we have their writings from that time. But nevertheless, this was a burden to them. This is a burden to Paul. I'm sure of it. But it's his attitude to that. How does he respond to it? Well, I know how I would respond to it. <laughs> Frustration wouldn't be the word. The sense of frustration, the sense of waste, the deprivation. I can hear myself saying it, or I'd be thinking it, this is not fair, or whatever. Surely he was tempted to think, I'm locked up here and I can't preach, and yet other people perhaps who can't preach as well as Paul could preach. They had the opportunity. So why am I silenced? I can hear him, I can, hear, I can feel for him. Normally, I have to say I'm sympathetic. I think I can almost say empathetic here. If you want to know the different sympathy, I stand alongside and I sort of feel for somebody, I put my arm around them and say, yes, I, I feel for you. Empathy is when you actually get inside their skin and you know what they're doing. You know, you actually walk in their shoes. You actually feel where it pinches because you know it. Now, I've never been deprived in, by prison. But I can feel for this man. What is more, he's not only deprived, he knows what's going on outside the jail. And some of that could have put salt into the wounds that this man has been inflicted with. Some of the events outside could have caused him real anguish of spirit. We'll come to that. Now, let me just come to this before I go any further. Perhaps I should have raised this before. Some of you may be saying, well, this is all very well, but there, there aren't many preachers here. And, uh, you know, okay, <laughs> this is a bit of a specialist subject, isn't it? No, no, not at all. Every believer, and if you're a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, every believer is a preacher. Every believer is a priest, in fact. Every believer is a king, according to my Bible, the priesthood of all believers. We are all called, as believers, to witness in some way or another, testify to the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. So it's not just men who stand in pulpits whatever that might mean, or stand on a dais or whatever. Every believer comes into this somewhere. In any case, it's not just simply the preaching. Every believer goes through experiences of frustration, deprivation, a sense of waste. Well, perhaps you haven't got there yet, but if, when you get to my stage in life, you look back and you can have a real sense of waste. The water's nearly all run out of the bucket. And what has it amounted to? And this kind of frustration and deprivation and anxiety and stress can come to us all in various ways. Afflictions are the lot of God's elect. I think it's Gadsby, isn't it? It might be, some of you will correct me. Is this the lot of God's elect? 
the hymn writer. Is this the lot of God? Is this what believers have to expect? Suffering, frustration. Paul says yes. He says it over and over again. All who will live in godly in Christ Jesus will meet troubles and trials and difficulties. The trial of our faith and so on. I've got many texts like this, but I'm not speaking on that this morning. The fact is, though, so it's not just for preachers, but any believer who's in a suffering sense or a, a time of affliction or uh, deprivation or anxiety or fear. I've, 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 I've heard a believer say, oh, I'm never afraid. Utterly ridiculous. Utterly ridiculous. The Bible says, I don't know, somebody said 365 times, the Bible says, fear not, fear not. God doesn't keep saying fear not because we're not afraid. How does Paul cope with this? This is the thing for me. So whether I'm a preacher, uh, what, uh, if I'm a believer, whatever state I am in with a sense of affliction and deprivation, what can I get from what Paul is saying here? Well, look how he reasons to himself. He says to these people, Philippians, in chapter, uh, chapter uh, verse uh, um, 12. I don't want you to be worried about it. You might think I'm in terrible trouble. I, I want you to understand, brethren. Don't get upset about it. The things which have happened to me, all these sufferings and afflictions, all these deprivations, all this anxiety, don't get carried away. All these things which have happened to me and here's a staggering statement. They have fallen out rather, what? To the furtherance of the gospel. Now don't let me just chunter on and let that wash over us. Here is a man who's got chains on his wrist He's shackled or whatever, I don't know, sore. It must be bleeding. He's de deprived from preaching. And yet he can say, all these things, and the worst to come, there's more other things to come, we'll see in a moment. All these things have actually worked out for the advance of the very gospel that they thought they were stopping. Let's say that again. They thought, and that's of course the devil's behind it, the devil thought that he was stopping Paul preaching. But Paul says, rather than, what well, he has actually stopped me preaching, but what's happened is, although he's kicked the fire and thinks he's put it out, he's made the sparks fly everywhere. The text that comes to my mind is Romans 8. All things work together for good to them that love God. Paul wrote that to the Romans, and he's living it out here. He's saying, what's happened here? I'm in prison. I'm deprived. I can't preach. That's bad. That's bad. That's bad. But the devil's overreached himself, because the truth is, these things have all combined together, actually, to advance the very gospel that they thought they were stopping. <coughs> well, how's that? Well, verse 13. The fact that Paul, this Jew, is in this palace jail down in the dungeons, people are talking about it in the palace. He says so. So that my bonds in Christ are manifest in all the palace. My chains are spoken about throughout the palace. In the kitchens, the cook saying to the butler, have you heard that about that chap down there? What's he doing down there? What are they, who's this, uh, what, what Paul his name is? What's this Jesus Christ he's preaching? And it's gone on talking. And the kitchen maid's drawn in. And she said, yeah, I, I, my, my sister told me. I, I heard about it. And the soldiers are talking about it. They have to sit next to him, you know. Read the Acts of the Apostles and you'll see these soldiers sit next to these prisoners sometimes. Keep them locked up. They come off duty and they say, who's that chap down there? What, what, what's he done? He's an odd bod. What's, he, what's this Jesus Christ they're preaching about? What, what's, he, what's he there for? He's gone up to the cabinet room in the palace. He's gone up to the secretariat. He's gone up to Caesar himself. They're all talking about it, he says. They're all talking about Paul? No. Well, they are. But when they talk about me, he said, 
And my bonds, yes, yes. But they've got to say why. And that soon gets them saying the word Christ. Now, I can't get to Caesar. I can't get to these soldiers. I, I, I can't call a meeting and get them in. I, I can't go and address them. But because of my bonds, the name of Christ is being sounded throughout the palace. And everywhere else too, he says in verse 13. Can you see how he's reasoning? Christ is being preached. In some way or another, the name of Christ is getting throughout the palace. It wouldn't have got there if I hadn't been put in prison. Then verse 14, some of the believers in Rome, if we're in Rome, wherever we are, some of the brethren outside, they hear about my sufferings. And what does that do for them? They wax confident by my bonds. Now, what does he mean by that? Well, I can empathize with this 100%. In life, I have learned more by watching others than ever I get out of textbooks. Let me explain to you. You can read a textbook on how to preach, if you like. But when you see a man really preaching, then you know. I shall never forget, 50 years ago now, more than that, Jeff Thomas preaching at a conference in Southampton on how to address unbelievers with the gospel. I can't remember what he said, but I know how he said it. I shall never forget it. I've told him this. And it was a great blessing to me because that day I saw what a man could do in preaching. I also knew before that, I was thinking, I think it was this morning about this, and I, 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 I remember that uh, man now. He was a London City missionary, and he took us out open-air preaching. And I saw the way I can see myself now. I, 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 I watched him, and I could see how he would address people in a park. We were there in a park or whatever, or on a street corner. And I saw him do it. And it gave me courage. I thought, if it can be done like this, it can be done like this. On another issue, watercolour painting. I was trying to learn to paint watercolours and doing the usual thing, getting nowhere with it. And one night I saw a man who could do it, actually do it. And I saw the way he sloshed it on. And I've... I won't say I'd never look back, but uh, that changed for me everything. Same with Winston Churchill, by the way, about painting. When he was depressed in the First World War, he took up oil painting and he was trying to paint and he said he dabbed a bit of blue ultramarine on the canvas for the sky. About as big as a bean, he said, about that big. And just then, Sir John Lavery's wife came in, and she was a painter, and she said, Winston, you don't do it like this. She said, you do it like this. You don't do it like that. You do it like this. And she just slashed it on. And he said, I've never been afraid of a canvas since. I saw it done. One thing I admire about Martin Luther, the great thing I admire about Martin Luther, he made many bad mistakes, tremendously bad mistakes. But the thing I admire about Martin Luther is this. Can you put yourself in his position in the early 1500s? There he is. He comes across in the Bible a text of scripture in Romans that tells him we are not saved by our works, but we are saved by the grace of God, by the mercy of God, by the love of the Lord Jesus Christ and his precious blood and so on. And he went to that text and he followed that text and he obeyed that text, even though it set him against the might and tradition 
and history of Rome. Can you imagine one man standing against the might of Rome because he sees scripture say something? I'm a number two in life. When I can see somebody else has gone ahead of me, I can follow. It's the pioneer that I admire, the man who goes first. I don't know how many people have climbed Everest since, but think of the courage of Tensing and Hillary in 53. Think of them getting up there. Think of the men that went before, people like Mallory who died on Everest. Think of the men who the pioneers leading ahead. They give courage to the men that come behind. Now this is what Paul says. There are people outside, they hear that I'm suffering. They think, well, if he can do it, if he's willing to pay this price, I'll go and do it. And they wax bold. And praise God, he says for it. I rejoice in it. I can't preach, I know. Perhaps these aren't such good preachers as me, but okay, I rejoice, he said, that they are preaching because they've got courage from me. This is what he says. They do say that confession is good for you. Do you want me to have a give, give you a confession? Well, I will give you a confession. It happened again this week as I was preparing for this. Well, I have prepared for this, and something happened that did this again. I'll explain what I mean. I'll explain it, first of all, by an illustration. There is a famous playwright who has recorded, writes books, plays and stuff, and he's recorded this. When he opens the newspaper and he comes across a review written by somebody in the paper, a review of some other author, some other writer, some other play, and that review is very high, very good. This is a great play, this is great. So you see what he is, he's a, he's a playwright himself, but he reads in a magazine or a paper, he reads about a fellow writer who gets credit marks, wonderful high praise. This writer I'm talking to you about, talking to you about is honest enough to say that says this, I feel a pang. What pang? Jealousy. Somebody else has got the praise, why can't I have it? Now, he's honest enough to admit it. I wonder if I'll say we, I could say you, are honest enough to admit that. You arrange flowers and somebody else gets a bigger mark than yours. You play the piano, or whatever it is, but somebody gets a higher grade than you. It's not always easy, easy to rejoice in the success of others, is it? It's not always easy to rejoice in the success of others. I'm not praising this, I'm confessing it. What I like about Paul here, which I can't understand, he can rejoice in the success and the prosperity of others. They have liberty, they're preaching, I can't but I still rejoice, that's staggering, you know, to me. I know we should love others as ourselves. This man loves others better than himself. Hasn't stopped. He knows that some of these professed believers outside who are preaching are doing it for the wrong motives. Now, some are doing it for the right motives. They do out of love. They do out, he says so in verse, um, verse 15. Some do it because they, they're boldened by my sufferings. They, they're, they're, and I'm glad about that. But you know, he said some of them are doing it to add affliction to my bonds. He says that in verse 16. What do you mean? Well, let me give you a story. I believe it to be a true story. Some men went to hear George Whitfield preaching. And they went there with the purpose of watching him and coming back to the tavern and 
copying him so they could raise a laugh in the tavern. And this is what they did. They went to hear Whitfield preaching and they went back to the tavern and one of them got onto the bench and he started to preach like George Whitfield. And of course, everybody in the tavern laughed. This is what's happening to Paul. Some are preaching in such a way as to cause him sorrow and grief and add to his tension. But he says, even that doesn't bother me. I rejoice, in fact. Why? For this one reason again, the same as that gossip in the kitchen maids and, the, and, and Caesar. Because when these people are preaching, whether they're preaching for the right reason or the wrong reason, when they're taking the mickey out of me, whatever they're doing, they've got to mention the name of Christ. And because they mention the name of Christ, I rejoice. That's what he says. Christ is preached, verse 18. And it's because of that, that's what sustains me. By the way, I didn't finish that story about Whitfield. As I understand the story, I think I've read it. This man stood on the bench in the tavern and he preached like George Whitfield. And somebody was converted. The devil overreaches himself. Whitfield couldn't preach in the tavern. <laughs> that man would never have gone to hear Whitfield. But he heard him in the tavern from an idiot, yes. But he was converted all the same. I'm not excusing the taking the mickey. I'm not excusing all the rest of it. But I am saying that all things do work together for good. And Paul is rejoicing in this. How did he get here? How did he get this? Well, this is what he writes in the fourth chapter. This is what Paul writes to the Philippians in the fourth chapter. And he says this. Verse 11 of chapter 4. I have learned, he said, whatsoever state I am, in whatever state I am, therewith to be content. That knocks me back. Have you learned that? I haven't learned it yet. To be content in every state. I know both how to be abased and I know how to abound. I'm able to be full, I'm to be able to be hungry, abound and suffer need. I can do all through things through Christ, which strengthens me. This man is not only saved from his sins, he's not only going to get eternal glory when he dies and, you know, and Christ comes back. You know, there's all that true. But even now in his afflictions, Christ able to sustain him when he's in prison, when he's deprived, when he's frustrated, when he's afflicted, when people are laughing at him, mocking him, and whatever it is, bleeding, whatever it is, he still can rejoice in Christ. 2 Corinthians 12 I rejoice in sufferings, he said, because in my weakness, then I am strong. The grace of Christ is sufficient for me. I want that. I want to know that. When I'm tempted to be jealous or uh, frustrated or raise my fist or cry out or whatever. I want to know this spirit that I can see God working all things together for good. I've preached it. <laughs> it's easy to preach, but it's living it. I have learned in every state to be content. I, I haven't got there yet. And if you look at the whole chapter, if you look at this passage again, the word Christ keeps coming over and over again. If you took one of those magic markers and you underlined Christ, you know, you highlined it, it looked like the page would look like they've got the measles. All these Christs everywhere. Christ, Christ, Christ. This man is full of Christ. 
If a set of John Bunyan, if you pricked him, you didn't get blood. You got something called Bibline, whatever that was, text of scripture. If you prick Paul, you don't get blood, you get Christ. I tell you, this man is always preaching about Christ. And this man rejoices that Christ is preached even when he can't preach. Well, I've got one last thing to bring up. I've hinted at it already. The application, I think, is very clear to those of us who are believers. I need this. I need to have this sense of God is sovereign. He's working all things. All things are there. You are the potter. I am the clay. All things are working well. I might be in prison. I might be this. I might be deprived. I can't do that. I'm not all the rest of it. But God is working all things out for good. Some of us have to go back to difficult circumstances. Perhaps we don't know we're going back to difficult circumstances because we don't know what a day is going to bring forth. This is a wonderful standard, isn't it? The grace of Christ, which was sufficient for this man, is sufficient for us, for me. And I have to live to prove it. I've been rebuking myself by this discourse. But there's one final thing. I did hint at it in passing. I said about the furtherance of the gospel. Why? Look, my friend, what made this man tick? What was this man about? I've talked about sufferings. I've talked about prison. I've talked about this and that and the other. But what's the real matter here? It isn't prison. It isn't sufferings. It's Christ. That's the real matter. That's the real point. And as we look at our lives, people think about money and jobs and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, I mean, yeah, they're, they're all important, I dare say. But Christ, what do I know of Christ? Christ, Christ. I've chosen a strange hymn to finish with. Hark how the gospel trumpet sounds. Christ and free grace therein abounds. That doesn't seem to fit the subject. And yet it does, you know. Think about it. What this man rejoices in is whatever happens to him, the gospel trumpet is blasted in Rome. And it's still being blasted this morning, even here at Haverhill, because I'm reading it, I'm preaching it. It's still sounding. 2,000 years later, we're still talking about it. And what are we talking about? Paul, yeah, that's very good. Sufferings, yes, that's very good. No, Christ. 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 My friend, does this man have something, someone that you don't have? Does he know something that you don't know? Yes, he does, if you're not a believer. He knows that Christ is precious. He knows that Christ is all. And so long as Christ is preached, what happens to him is not the most important thing in the world. What the most important thing is that Christ should be preached. Christ should be preached. And he rejoiced in that. Well, I found this passage remarkably challenging to me. I hope you have found it challenging. It's remarkably comforting, though, too, for the believer. May we, as he says in verse 21, for me to live is Christ, yeah, and to die is gain. Whatever comes, it's all for good. All things do work together for good to God's people. And if you're not a believer, my friend, Fly to Christ and become a believer. Then you will know all things work together for good to you too. Well, may God bless his word to us. Amen.